This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Thousands attend anti-government protests in Belarus as President Lukashenko asks his supporters to defend the country's independence. President Sol Ramaphosa eases some coronavirus pandemic restrictions in South Africa. And we update you on efforts to contain a looming ecological disaster in Mauritius after a ship with oil cargo breaks apart. Hello and a warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindy Mtongana in Nairobi. Also coming up this hour. An urban, an urban farming initiative boosts supply of fresh produce in Uganda amid the coronavirus pandemic. And we look at the impact of COVID-19 on culture and traditional practices in South Africa. We start the program in Somalia, where at least five people have been killed and 28 injured in an explosion at a hotel in the capital, Mogadishu. Police say the incident took place in the Elite Hotel in Lido Beach. A car exploded at the hotel entrance. The blast was followed by heavy gunfire. The newly built beachside hotel is often frequented by government officials. The government has deployed security forces to Lido Beach. A security official reported there may be an ongoing hostage situation taking place and that the death toll could rise. No group has immediately claimed responsibility for the attack, but local media reported that Islamist group Al-Shabaab is behind the blast. The Al-Qaeda-linked militant group often carries out attacks in the Somali capital. Well, let's get to the very latest now on this attack in Mogadishu. Joining me is journalist Mohamed Kaye. Uh, Mohamed, if you could just tell us what is the latest on the ground following this daring attack by gunmen in the Somali capital? Well, this is an uh, ongoing security operation as well as the uh, medical evacuation. Uh, the government uh, minister of information has just confirmed that uh, uh, two of the five people who lost their lives at the attack are government officials. One senior official attached to the Ministry of Information and another uh, attached to the Ministry of Defense. There is an ongoing security operation by Somali security forces and uh, because the fighters are still inside and uh, they are heavy gunfire which is going on. Uh, well, uh, there is also uh, the presence of the senior Somali security officials at the hotel. Uh, they, 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 they are about to brief the media, but the, there are no cameras allowed near, to, near the, 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 the hotel. So that is the latest that is uh, happening right now. But still, the fighters are inside and uh, they are exchanging uh, gunfire with the, uh, with the security forces which are trying to rescue people who are still trapped inside. And Mohammed, how have authorities in Mogadishu responded to this attack? And what measures are in place to boost public safety in Mogadishu? Mohammed, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Clear? Yes, so I'm asking just if you could explain to us what authorities are doing to secure the area and to boost public safety this evening. Well, uh, all areas heading to that uh, uh, popular area, which is uh, near the beach, is closed. Uh, there is uh, ongoing security operations as well as uh, medical evacuations uh, for those people who are trapped. Uh, according to the medical sources and ambulances, local ambulance called I mean ambulance, they say that they rescued more than they rescued more than 30 people who had uh, different kind of injuries, and they have been admitted to various hospitals in the capital here in Mogadishu. Uh, okay. Right now, the uh, massive uh, security operations going on there. The fighters are still inside, as I have told you. There are people still trapped inside. Some of them are communicating through online that they're saying they're still inside there. They need help from the people outside. So this, this situation is still tense and uh, there is uh, exchange of uh, fire between the Somalia security forces and the fighters who are about uh, four, which are inside the, 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 this uh, popular hotel, which was just opened uh, one year ago. 
Thank you so much. Mohamed Kayir joining us there from Mogadishu. Now let's go to Belarus, where thousands of protesters have been taking part in anti-government uh, protests in the capital, Minsk. Demonstrators are contesting the outcome of last week's presidential elections. The contested results hand a sixth term to the incumbent leader, Alexander Lukashenko. Similar marches have been reported in other cities across Belarus. The march is being promoted by Sviatlana Chikanuskaya, who was the main opposition candidate in the elections. There were reports of military vehicles and riot police being deployed in Minsk. Well, on the other hand, pro-government protesters attended a rally in Minsk to show support to Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. President Lukashenko called on his followers to defend their country and their independence. Official results say he won that sixth term in last, uh, last week's presidential election with about 80% of the vote. Lukashenko has been in power since 1994. My dear friends, I did not call you here today for you to defend me, although that as well. You came here to defend your country, your independence, your families, your wives, your sisters and your children for the first time in a quarter of a century. Meanwhile, Lukashenko has warned of a NATO military buildup on the borders of Belarus. NATO has dismissed the claim but says it is closely monitoring the situation in the country. In a phone conversation with Lukashenko, President Vladimir Putin said Russia is ready to provide military assistance if necessary. Now let's turn to news from South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa has announced the easing of coronavirus restrictions. The country will move to a level two lockdown from Tuesday. The number of new cases has dropped over the past month from a peak of over 13,000 a day to a daily average of 5,000. Our reporter Angela Coppola brings us more on the story. The South African president announced that the sale of cigarettes and alcohol will be allowed again. At the same time, people can travel for leisure and cross provincial borders. But there's still no international travel. The move to level two means that we can remove nearly all of the restrictions on the resumption of economic activity across most industries. Economic activity will be allowed with the necessary and appropriate stringent health protocols and safety precautions in place. But the nighttime curfew remains in place and this could affect economic recovery plans. The key thing for me was the fact that the Disaster Management Act and the state of disaster continues. Uh, this is deeply problematic. It enforces a curfew of 10 p.m. around the country, which is going to significantly hamper industrial recovery. You're already reeling with uh, the effects of the lockdown and the restrictions. Now added to the woes of uh, load shedding. And it's now made it impossible for them to have a night shift to try and make up for time lost during the day due to load shedding and lost productivity. Some are suggesting that the decision to further ease the COVID-19 lockdown provides some level of certainty. The country feels a sense of relief um, and perhaps even a modest glimmer of, uh, of hope or, or encouragement from some return to, uh, to normality uh, and even if the way in which we conduct ourselves is not the same as before. The nature and extent of our activity can show uh, you know, a resumption of that normality. The government has been working with its social partners in labor and business to find solutions. Even as we open up economic activity, it will take a long time for industries and businesses to recover. And there is much work still to be done. We are now working together on an urgent economic recovery program that places the protection and creation of employment at its center, focusing on infrastructure and a number of other sectors of our economy. It's been five months of economic destruction and it's now time to rebuild the country's economy. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Authorities in Mauritius are racing against time to prevent an environmental catastrophe after the shipwrecked MV Wakashio split apart. Reports indicate that officials have declared the area around the scene a no-go zone and volunteers have actually been asked to halt their activities. 
Although officials reported most of the fuel was pumped out before the vessel split, about 90 tons was believed to still be on board. Cleanup activities had continued on Saturday. Authorities in Mauritius partnered with volunteers from diplomatic missions, international organizations and NGOs. Expertise, equipment and other support was offered in the cleanup process. We have had 15 kilometers of coast which has been uh, damaged. We have also the lagoons which have been damaged. And uh, we have to, this is the, the emergency today is to clean up. We have had uh, all the missions which have been very helpful. Those who are nearer, France and Reunion Island, they sent uh, loads of equipment, of logistical support and experts. From China we have had the equipment, we have had also the logistical support, we have also the experts who are here, and uh, we have also from the United Nations a very strong team. Up to now we have about 22 experts, but we are expecting as many more coming, because it's a very big challenge. It's environmental, it's ecological, it's financial, it's social. Uh, it's so, so the damage is in the lagoon, in the community. The damage is for the, for the flora, the fauna. So we need a lot of experts to help us. For example, you have the legal issues, you have the issues about claims, you have the issues about how to help the, the community. And we don't know how long, for how long. We have to assess. Let's take a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Coming up, an urban farming initiative boosts the supply of fresh produce in Uganda amid the coronavirus pandemic. And we look at the impact of COVID-19 on culture and traditional practices in South Africa. Taking care of uh, COVID-19 patients, there's always the anxiety. Handling money is very dangerous. Wearing of masks has become the new normal for some of them while performing. Ban of alcohol in South Africa. I don't have a job. In Uganda, an urban farming initiative has been supplying its neighborhood with fresh produce. The coronavirus pandemic has left many jobless and unable to afford nutritious meals. Isabel Nakiria reports. Patrick Marvin's garden is looking a lot more colorful during the coronavirus pandemic. He and his group are dedicating themselves to improving nutrition in his neighborhood in Kamocha, an informal settlement in Kampala. They are helping others set up their own urban farms. We chose a certain group of people, the, the, the vulnerable people like the pregnant mothers, the very old people, the lamb, who couldn't even uh, find something to eat. So we went and trained them uh, in a social distancing, distancing style and we supply, we gave to them sacks, five, five each. So they could, like the ready sacks for harvesting. So we trained them how they could water them and do the harvesting slowly by slowly. Marvin says many more backyard gardens are sprouting up in his neighborhood. Many people are choosing to stay away from crowded places like markets. <laughs> Now I don't lack soap in my house. I don't even lack salt or food. Now I'm about to plant more vegetables. I'm going to plant more onions, tomatoes and okra. Gardening was once a hobby for people living in the city, but with the coronavirus pandemic, much more is coming out of backyard gardens like this one. First time gardeners are now staying out of grocery stores to save some money. Marvin sells most of his vegetables to walk-in customers for less than a dollar. He also supplies several grocery stores in Kampala. His, all his products are organic. He doesn't spray them. And uh, this brings to us stand. Since we act organics, we deal with organics, and he supplies, he supplies us with organic stuff, it's really very good. Turning polythene sacks and plastic tents into mini gardens to create more planting space. Even so, Marvin is now planning to expand out of the city. Here we don't have enough space to train, uh, to accommodate even 20 people at a go. So we just have to, do, to, to get them in shifts. It is so tiresome. With the coronavirus still spreading and many people staying home, Marvin and his group will likely be helping establish more and more backyard gardens. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda. 
In Somalia, the government has reopened primary and secondary schools. That's four months after they were closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Education Minister, Godar Barre, says the government has put in place the necessary preventative measures to ensure smooth learning resumes across the Horn of Africa nation. Tuli Shabalala has more. Somalia closed learning institutions in April following a spike in coronavirus cases. According to the Ministry of Health, the Horn of Africa nation has over 3,000 COVID-19 infections. In the midst of the ongoing global pandemic, authorities decided to reopen primary and secondary schools. We restarted classes on Saturday. The COVID-19 disease is still present in parts of the world. God willing, we are now in a good condition. The COVID-19 disease has had a negative impact on many parents and teachers alike, and it forced us to cut salaries in order to get over that period. All learners will be required to wear face masks and maintain physical distancing to help contain the respiratory disease. Many pupils are delighted to be back in the classroom to resume learning. During the coronavirus pandemic period, I felt bored and depressed. I even attended online classes that I couldn't understand very well, and sometimes the communication was bad. Today I am very pleased to come back to school and join my classmates once again, safe and sound. Words can't express how happy I am today to come back to school. We were out of school for four months because of COVID-19, so I'm happy to once again join my friends and restart learning. Health ministry figures indicate that less than 100 people have died from the disease since the first COVID-19 case in the country was first reported. Tuli Shabalala, CGTN. In South Africa, traditional practices are being held up as the COVID-19 pandemic drags on. Coronavirus cases are now heading toward the 600,000 mark. Julie Shire has more on the winter initiation season, which has been cancelled this year over fears of the virus spreading. In South Africa, the initiation into manhood involves spending weeks in mountainous areas in harsh conditions. This tradition is seen as a necessary part of the passage from boyhood to manhood. The COVID-19 has disrupted everything and put rites of passage on hold. Since the lockdown started, there's nothing we can do. The ceremonies, we have to cancel. Other initiates are from outside the province, so we can't even go there because of this lockdown. Even the circumcision, everything has been cancelled due to this. So I don't know whether they will start afresh, maybe, uh, I don't know. But for us, it's really hard. It's created a backlog in terms of every fa families and communities expectations of certain rituals that need to be uh, performed at a certain time, at a certain age. The rite of passage for an African man is everything, irrespective of the fact that we live in a globalized world. Tatu Kekana is an initiate training to be a traditional healer. COVID-19 restrictions have also delayed his process. My journey um, towards being a spiritual healer started about 11 years ago. It all actually got to a, a, a breaking point earlier this year, around February. When I started, it was when lockdown started. Taking the decision to accept your calling, I think, is the most difficult thing any human being has to go through. Since 1995, several hundred initiates have died after undergoing ritual circumcision. We've always seen that around this time we have lots of fatalities in the initiation schools whether it's circumcision or it's traditional healing. In Southern Africa, um, we, we've had laws that were very repressive and oppressive towards traditional practices. So um, regulation, transparency and things like that have not really been at the forefront of, of traditional practices. There's been councils that have been formed to oversee and authorize and accredit traditional healers and ensure that if there's any negative outcome from people visiting your practice that you can be held accountable. Kekana hopes his calling serves those who need his help. This process of initiation and the entire journey is important to me because key part of who I am. 
it, it defines me. The practice of being a traditional healer is an ancient practice that goes back to the first mother and the first father. And it, it is an unbroken chain of spiritual connectivity to the first man and woman. Traditional healers are concerned about the absence of cultural rituals during COVID-19 regulations. They have no other option but to wait. But Kekana's desire to finish training and help others remains as strong as ever. Julie Sharat, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Coming up in your sports news up next.